Hi again, it's Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm, and today I want to answer the question of what are the first steps you should take if you're setting up a nursery, a plant nursery, all of your own. Should you start by buying a piece of land and setting up a couple of greenhouses? Should you then fill them with a bunch of plants? Or maybe you should start with the retail end and set up a little shop or store of your own. Or you could start with the branding, set up a great nursery name and set up a website and get business cards. And in my view, the first steps you should take are much smaller and much more mundane than those. And I'll put up a list on the screen right now of those that I would recommend you start with to set up your own plant nursery. And uh, I'll also put timestamps on these so that you know where in the video to skip to if one of these topics appeal to you more than the others. The first step, in my opinion, is to get your hands on some plants or plant-related product and begin selling them at a smaller scale. Now you'll notice when I said that, I didn't say that you had to grow the plants and you certainly don't have to have a greenhouse full of them. What are your other options? Well, you don't, if you don't have to grow them, you can look at things like wholesale growers, other wholesale growers in your area, or brokers, or you can buy in some bulbs and start them that way. So you don't have to grow these things from beginning to end, and it's important that you begin to test the market. Now, if you do happen to have some plants of your own, if you have a, a, a house full of house plants that you've taken divisions of, if you have some garden plants that you can divide, that's a valid way to start too. But the point here is not to wait until you have a giant assortment of plants and try to grow and fill a whole assortment and selection of plants. You really do need a way to test that market first. So even if it's just a matter of getting some cuttings and listing them on Craigslist or Facebook and start selling them that way, or getting some bulbs from a supplier, putting them in some pots in early spring, growing them into color and showing up at your farmer's market in a backyard gardener table. Uh, it, it's as easy as that. I mean, my first foray into, into growing really was a tray of alpine strawberries that I grew and I put them on Craigslist humble beginnings. But I have it on good authority that one of the biggest flower growers in Ontario started with a crate of bulbs from Holland and one of the biggest growers in California started with a mom and pop operation growing plants in their backyard and taking them out and selling them from the back of a truck. So humble beginnings but the first thing is that you have to get used to trying to sell plants before you invest a whole lot more into trying to grow them. Step number two that I'm going to talk about can sound a little intimidating. I get some questions around this, and so I want to talk about it in a little bit of depth. Sorry, it's going to make the video go long, but it's about regulations. Now, I don't make the rules. I just have to follow them. And all I'm encouraging you to do with this step is to assess your local, state, and federal laws as they apply to our trade so that you don't trip over them later as you grow your business. It's true that at early stages, as you're doing it on a small scale, there's not that much that applies to you. So if you start a whole bunch of seedlings in your backyard, you end up selling them at a plant sale or farmer's market, you know, there's really not that much in terms of regulations that apply to you. If you took some divisions of house plants and you end up selling those through, again, Facebook Facebook or Craigslist and selling them locally to, to buyers, again, there's not that much that applies to you. But again, as soon as you start shipping your plants across state lines, now you have some restrictions that are related to phytosanitary matters. So the, the risk that you could move a pest from one jurisdiction to another. And in that case, you may be dealing with USDA regulations or state regulations around the movements of plants. So those are the kinds of things you have to keep in mind. Do you need a business license? Okay, in my case, I have a small to medium sized nursery. I don't require a business license in my area where we live in an unincorporated area. And in Canada, in, under our laws, uh, if you do farm gate sales, if you sell off of your own farm, you don't require permission of your municipality to go ahead and do that if you're on agricultural land. But if you're in a city, your situation may be different. If you tried to set up a, a booth or a stand or a front yard nursery uh, in a city, you may have to get a business license for that, or there may be zoning requirements that you have to attend to. So that's one area that you may have to think about a little bit. Certainly you should expect that any time that you uh, earn some money through a business like this, that you have reporting requirements uh, related to taxes. That would be the same for any small business. Uh, so you just have to think about that part as well. Uh, in addition to that, and the only other group of regulations that I want to talk about just briefly here is around your right to propagate plants. So just in a nutshell, if you grow something from seed, 
you have the right to propagate that. No problem. That's called sexual propagation, taking it from a seed. If you try to do asexual propagation of plants, so you find something in a garden center, you'd like to sell it, you want to divide it or take cuttings, in that case, if you're running as a nursery, you probably should familiarize yourself with the laws around asexual propagation, patents on plants, and so on. Again, I don't make the rules. I'm just trying hard to follow them and not ruin my reputation in the industry. So in that case, I do have a video that talks about the use of patents in, uh, in plants, and I'll link that one up above so you can have a slightly more de detailed discussion on that. Uh, but as I say, as you move your, your business along, just start to keep in mind those things that could apply to you either at the local, state, or federal level about the growing and selling of plants, and I'll leave it at that. Step number three, or at least as I have them, is to learn to grow and propagate plants. And a lot of people would have this down as step number one, and that's okay if you want to start here and work backwards a little bit. Uh, but ultimately, the point is that eventually, you have to get good at growing and propagating plants. And it helps in this case that if you're a bit of a plant geek, like uh, here I'm doing a bit of an experiment on propagating underlights using water, as a way to root or using soil as a way to root. I also obviously do my main propagation out in the greenhouse, but I'm using these humidity domes as kind of a cool way to experiment. Like I say, it benefits you a little bit if you like to play with plants. So uh, learning how to propagate plants, grow plants well, it's a process. It's going to take you some time, but it's an important stage to master if you want to run your own backyard nursery. The fourth step I'm going to recommend here has a lot to do with marketing, or more specifically, social media marketing, because it is one of those rare areas in the industry where you are going to have an upper hand versus larger competitors. The reason for that is because in social media, Instagram, YouTube, on Facebook, People connect with others who have similar interests to theirs and who show off as genuine about that interest. That's kind of hard to do and hard to display as a larger competitor, a big corporate face. Uh, now, they may have the upper hand when it comes to newspaper advertising, TV advertising, radio, uh, glossy magazine ads, and so on. Okay, that's fine, but I don't think that marketing is really going anywhere. As an individual, you can go out on Instagram, put out some pictures of your of your of your business and connect with others who share that passion and that's where it really is at. Now, in my example, I went ahead and I did Instagram and I had some success there. I found that the best place for me to connect in a more meaningful way was on YouTube. Now, obviously, part of why I'm doing that is because I love talking about roses. I love connecting with other gardeners about roses, but the other part is because I wanted to promote my business and it's been working. You, it, in, in recent days, it's been easier for people to get people to show up to my plant selling events. It's been easier to sell online. So this year, particularly with, with a lot of what was happening with COVID and having to sell curbside at my farm, I honestly think it was my YouTube presence that helped me to survive through that as a business. So it, the sooner you can establish some kind of meaningful social media uh, presence, the better. I did make a video on talking about connecting with garden clubs, connecting with social media. I will link that above as well if you want a more in-depth uh, talk on the topic, but the main thing is to just get started in one way or another. The fifth thing you should do, and it's not a sexy topic so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but it's keeping records. You should have a spreadsheet with your production numbers, what you've put into pots, and you should keep some records of how you've sold. This here would represent an early version of my production records. Uh, these are just the plant tags that I use to sell them at the farmer's market. And on the back, I've made some notes about how it turned out. In this case, of course, I had my sales by week, and then I also recorded when I had it sold out. Uh, same for this one here, which was sold a bit earlier in the season and were ready early. Uh, but I have it noted down here that by week 20, they were in poor condition. I'm using uh, botanical weeks here or just uh, calendar weeks uh, to record it because then I compare it from year to year so I can plan when I'm going to have these ready for the next time. So I won't spend too much time on that, but uh, I think it's important that at least uh, at some basic level that you're keeping records of how much you're producing and how much you're selling. 
Final topic for the video today is securing supplies for your business and there's no getting around it. No matter what size you're trying to run your business, you're going to have to find a place where you're going to get your soil, where you're going to pick up your plastic, where you grab your fertilizer and some of that unfortunately I can't help you with very specifically. I can tell you where I got it but I can't tell you where to get it locally in your area except beyond general advice and tips. So the soil that I'm using that you see in the pile back here is based on wood products. It's uh, composted bark mix mixed with some shredded wood fibers. It's mixed by a local uh, potting soil producer. So it's somebody who custom mixes this based on our local horticulture industry. The problem with that answer is that of course I can't tell you who's going to be offering a wood-based product in Surrey, England. It's not something that I can tell you or even whether that such a, a product is available there. I can tell you that peat and perlite based mixes are widely available in North America. So something like Sunshine Mix, Pro Mix, I think Berger makes a mix. So there are suppliers that will offer those in the compressed bales and deliver them even in, in tall compressed bales to remote locations. So that's something that's possible. But wherever you can, it's always going to work out to be more advantageous to get a local supplier of potting soil. Uh, you may want to go and check your other local nurseries and see what they're doing for that. While you're there, ask about plastic because some people use smaller sizes, some people use larger sizes. I know that my local uh, blueberry producers, uh, they get their plants in in this size and they end up with a giant stack of them. So I'm able to pick these up from blueberry guys from between five and 10 cents a pot, which is a great savings over what I would spend if I got those from the horticulture supply store. Uh, speaking of the horticulture supply store, uh, you may have a dedicated horticulture supplier in your area or you may have to go through something more general like a feed store or agriculture store. So unfortunately in these cases I'm not going to be much use to you in terms of giving you specific recommendations only that uh, very likely the best piece of advice I can give you is to talk to other local growers and try to share some information that way. Uh, they'll know where they're getting their soil, where they're getting their plastic, where they pick up their fertilizer and uh, they may be able to help you out with that. Okay those are that's it for my uh, six steps to starting your own nursery business. I hope you found it helpful. If you have questions, I've been through this, uh, at least in my specific area, so I may be able to help you out with that. Leave those in the comments below the video.